Coming up on FTC Recap, Rev Robotics releases new documentation for their parts. Game Annual Part 1 was released, the team Pixelated has released a Crash Course video series, and sports are starting back up again. We'll have further discussion about all the changes in Game Annual Part 1, and end with fun trivia where the current prize pool is $30. All coming up here on FTC Recap. Giving you a voice. Making it loud our own way. Welcome, Welcome to the fun. fun. First updates now, FTC is produced in partnership with the Orange Alliance. Make TOA your place to go for FTC team stats and event results at theorangealliance.org. And also, viewers like you. We need your help to keep fun loud, live, and independent. Help us by visiting our Patreon to pledge your support at patreon.com forward slash first updates now. You can also support fun live on Twitch for a few bucks a month or by linking your Prime account for free and clicking subscribe. Welcome to FTC Recap, where you get the latest breakdown and discussion of what's going on in the FTC community. For first updates now, I'm Ishan Oberoi. Joining me is Egan Donnelly. We've got lots to cover in the show, so let's jump into our headlines. Rev Robotics recently updated their FTC starter kit and now release new documentation for many of their products. They release a new website, doc.revrobotics.com, in order to consolidate all their documentation. The website has sections for FTC, FRC, First Global, and is organized to make it easier for teams to find what they're looking for. Much of the documentation has also been updated to include the latest specs from revisions of products they've released. You check this out, Egan? Yeah, I uh, I saw someone talking about it on the FTC Discord the other day, and I had to look to to see it for myself because uh, finding stuff on Rev's website has always been a, a chore. Um, and now that everything's you know all in one place, uh, like finding motor specs, uh, encoder counts, all that good stuff, now that it's all in one place, it just makes that process so much easier. Yeah, awesome. All right, so uh, our first major sport is returning since COVID, and that would be baseball. Uh, games begin tomorrow the 22nd with the first series between the Yankees and the Nationals uh, in our nation's capital. Social distancing and empty stadiums will be in effect. Uh, these measures aren't as strict as what the NBA is doing with their bubble in Walt Disney World, uh, where they're enforcing strict health checks um, and ensuring you can only enter if you test negative twice. Um, although the uh, MLB is doing a lot of testing to prevent COVID from spreading between the players and the team staff. They will have a shortened season, you know, but something is better than nothing, and I'm glad we can uh, return somewhat to normal uh, and get some sports on TV. Yeah, I'm a big Nats fan, so really looking forward to tomorrow. Uh, I think like this goes to show, like yes, in a controlled environment, you can start to do stuff, and hopefully we'll see it as COVID hopefully gets better. Uh, we can start seeing first events as well. Um, so, yeah. as many of you know, just this past week, first launched Game Manual Part One in a unique way. They split it up into two different versions, one with remote events and one for traditional events. While competition style and format will this year will vary heavily by region, uh, there are some interesting and notable changes to the traditional game. For example, they've changed the advancement order, so control is now higher than motivate and design. Uh, finally, software is getting the recognition they don't deserve. They have uh, also removed engineering notebook from the game manual, uh, so now it's all engineering documentation. And uh, through some research from other sources, it looks like that this documentation is going to be much shorter in length, uh, making it easier for the judges to look it over in quality. Uh, we're going to have a further discussion about this and the changes that have been made uh, later on in the show, but I think it's some cool changes. It seems like the FTC, FTC is listening to the first community. What do you think, Egan? Yeah, I... Definitely um, making it not a contest of who's got the thickest notebook and heaviest notebook uh, <laughs> is a welcome improvement for me uh, because I know writing out daily logs is not my favorite thing to do. Um, but we will have to see. Uh, I believe in two weeks we get the awards section, and that'll go over all of the uh, spe specifics on what the new engineering documentation is going to be. 
Uh, moving on, the Valor CAD challenge took place this past week with the game Hex Force, uh, which involved robots collecting hexagons and scoring them into ports at different heights. Robots will also be able to park in a parking zone, or they can build a bar and hang on that for points in endgame. Uh, their award ceremony for that is going to be tonight at 9 o'clock Eastern Time. Uh, sorry if you don't live in Eastern Time. You'll have to convert that yourself. Um, but this was an interesting game. Uh, the elements had, uh, I think, a geotagging or something to them to where they could remotely become uh, contaminated or be uncontaminated, and you'd have to clean them up. Uh, yeah. Sean? Yeah, I thought I thought the game was pretty cool with the contamination part. It was kind of interesting to see like having electronics inside of the game elements. Uh, the the award ceremony is actually going to be I think right after this show, uh, 9 p.m. Eastern time is when the show is about to end. So uh, you can go check that out. I also thought that it was cool that robots would place the bar that they hang on. Like that's something we haven't seen before. We kind of had it with the hook because it was hard to hang off of a hook in Rovaruckus, but yeah. uh, that might be something cool that first could implement uh, for this new season. Um, also, uh, just recently, it was announced that the popular car soccer game Rocket League will be play free to play in the Epic Game Store soon. Uh, this summer is the ETA. Uh, it will be leaving the Steam store, and players who have already purchased it will get some uh, in-game items to compensate for it. Uh, it sounds like a great way for more people to get involved with the fun Rocket League tournaments that we've been having. We had one this past weekend, and I heard it was a huge success, but I don't own Rocket League, but I will now. Um, and it looks like Epic Games is continuing with their model of free-to-play games with in-game purchases just like Fortnite. Uh, I know. Do you play Rocket League a lot, Egan? Uh, I was actually playing it just before I got on the show. Uh, <laughs> I'm no good though. Yeah. I'm I'm a little I'm a little iffy on that. Yeah, I really only have Epic Games for the free stuff. Uh, not Fortnite though. I don't play Fortnite. <laughs> um, but moving moving off of Steam is, is it's a negative for me. But I'm sure it'll uh, it'll we'll have a lot more um, competition possibly with uh, the fun tournaments uh, later on. I was going to so say, kids, that's, make sure yeah. you grab your uh, mom's credit card and uh, make sure you purchase everything you can uh, within that. Like that one person who bought uh, $20,000 worth of bits on their parents' credit card on Twitch recently. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah. Uh, and finally, FTC team 12835 Pixelated from Granger, Indiana, has began a comprehensive series of training videos relating to all things FTC, called FTC Crash Course. In the videos, they cover just about everything from software to CAD to awards, judging, uh, etc. The videos are releasing on a weekly schedule and targeted at helping teams at all levels. Uh, I saw on their YouTube channel, they just released the second video in their design part of that series um, earlier today. And uh, I'll have to go check that out. It seems like it would be a pretty cool... Um, a recruiting tool or teaching tool to get uh, new new kids onto the team. What do you think about that, Sean? Yeah, I, I think it's a great one-stop shop for rookie teams that are trying to understand a little bit of everything in FTC. Uh, I mean, Pixelated, they've been to the World Championship many times before, and I think that they're one of the teams that a lot of people look up to. So it's cool to see them reaching out into the community and trying to help out younger teams uh, and get them involved. Uh, we we've in the FTC community we've had resources spread out all over the place and so I think they're trying to consolidate a lot of what people have I'd love to see them interact with teams and get other teams on for these uh, pixelated crash courses I think that would be something cool to see all right and we asked you guys in the chat uh, are you guys happy with the notebook changes and most of you said yes and I would I think most of the FTC community is pretty happy that we don't have to log every single thing in our notebook. While it is good practice as an engineer, uh, it can be tedious at times. So uh, it is it is a nice uh, change. Um, so with that being said, that was all of our headlines. We're going to switch into the dust. Uh, we're going to switch into let's discuss that where we're going to discuss uh, the new game manual. So one of the major things that people have been complaining about in FTC is the ranking system, since it was based off of wins and losses and didn't take into account your score if you won. 
the new ranking system is based off of the sum of the team's alliances throughout the competition. Is this a step in the right direction or the ideal ranking system for FTC? Uh, based on what I've read about it, I think it's a, another step in the right direction. Uh, I know for Skystone, they did uh, tweak the tiebreaker point system a little bit. Um, I forget exactly what that was, but I remember a lot of people complaining about that during uh, Rover Ruckus. So, you know, moving towards something that that's a little uh, more representative of how well teams are doing, uh, as opposed to how bad their their uh, enemies are doing, uh, is definitely. A, a plus in in my book yeah i think like this is great because it rewards teams for doing well and i guess it promotes not having defense but sometimes i feel like the i like the frc ranking system the best um i don't know tyler if there's been many issues with it recently but the fact that you can earn ranking points and wins and losses are still considered but there's ways to fight even if you lose. Uh, I, I like that system a lot. Um, I do think that rewarding teams based off of their cumulative score is a step in the right direction, though. And they can use that as, like, instead of tiebreaker, or what was it, qualification points last year, or tiebreaker points last year, you use uh, cumulative uh, score points. And I think that would be a cool change to see in future seasons. Because I'm thinking that this ranking point change was kind of last minute with COVID. So one thing... I. I... I just want to add, since you uh, brought up for FRC on that, is uh, the one issue I have with ranking points in FRC as they currently stand right now is that they are, um, in many cases, very reliant on the entire alliance doing something. And when you have three robots on an alliance, if one craps out on you, then you know you, you can't necessarily get the ranking point for things, especially if you look at this year with... Uh, uh, I don't even remember the game anymore. Infinite Recharge. Infinite uh, the, Recharge. Yeah, I should remember it since it'll be back next year. But uh, <laughs> if you look at Infinite Recharge, for example, I mean, it, it was very difficult for teams to get, uh, you know, the ranking point for the uh, control panel. Um, and it really did need, a, you know, a lot of times three robots to, to even get close to that. Um, but the balancing as well, too, uh, you could get two with a balance, uh, in many cases, but if the other robot wasn't in the right position or both your robots died or something like that, it's pretty much impossible to get it by yourself. And that's something to me that I wish you could still accomplish an RP uh, by yourself in case you get a complete potato for an alliance partner. Yeah, I, I think that goes down to game design a lot and something that if FTC were to implement a way that you could earn extra RP in the game, uh, it would come down a lot into game design. Could a team carry themselves? Like the Cypher in Relic Recovery would be a great example of how teams could earn extra RP because that was something that a team could generally solo and with two good teams, you could double up. Um, yeah. I, I think overall, the community has been pretty receptive to this. And uh, I mean, it promotes not throwing matches and it promotes um, helping yourself. Yeah. All right. We ready to move on? <laughs> yep. Okay, so the engineering notebook, of course, as you all know, has been a massive part of FTC since it was started. Uh, but now, in uh, Game Manual 1, there's no reference to the engineering notebook, but rather engineering documentation. Um, there is no official statement yet on what the engineering documentation is, but uh, there are multiple sources saying it will be a much shorter version of the notebook and only around 15 pages. Um, I know... In the past, I've had, uh, with my team, we we ended up with a notebook that was all of the daily logs and then one that was an engineering notebook with mechanical drawings and explanations that was alone like 300 pages. Um, so it's, on, on one hand, uh, for me, it's a little comforting to know that there might be less just bloat in general uh, because I know the notebook person on our team was always interested in, you know, how many pages can we get? What's, uh, can we put that on its own page and stuff like that? So that, that's a little comforting for me, but the, uh, rumors about it being only about 15 pages, um, also makes it a little alarming because, uh, <laughs> if you, I think if you shorten it too much, you know, you might, uh, kind of destabilize the process, you know, like if, uh, an inspired team, might be closer to a um, 
like a lower tier team in terms of notebook in this in this case yeah i i think that with the notebook in the past it's been like um it's been like i know i've written 800 page notebooks with my teams and so like we're carrying around these thick notebooks the file management gets annoying um and judges can't read all of it right like at a qualifier it comes down to really random chance of which pages the judges do and don't read and yeah. so by having it a 15 page notebook hopefully it'll make judging a little bit more standardized across all ftc competitions um since they can then read the entire documentation instead of um, having to try to pour over an 800 page notebook. Um, and then also uh, one of the things I was sitting in was the Chesapeake town hall where they talked to FTC teams about what the season will look like next year. Uh, since they haven't officially released any information about what the engineering documentation will be next year, um, they were saying it would 15 pages approximately what it's going to be. And it's just going to be more like a portfolio. So I think you might show a little bit of your design process, a little bit of your outreach. The outreach is the hard one, I think, because the way that we would prove that we did all the outreach we did was with our outreach notebook. But now that you don't have that, how do you prove that you did any of it? So uh, we'll have to see what FTC says. Do you know about when it's being released? Uh, I believe it's two weeks from now. Maybe a little less, but I don't know the exact date. That's just the general timeline there. Okay, chat, if you know when it's going to be, uh, let us know where we, a lot of it has been left in the dark and it just said coming soon for the award guidelines. So uh, okay. if you have any information, make sure to let us know and we'll try to include it. Yeah. Uh, that's interesting, the thing you brought up about the outreach section and how teams would... Uh, prove their stuff. Um, I've had some people in FRC tell me that uh, when when you're putting outreach into your notebook, you kind of just say that you did it and you don't really have to have pictures or anything because I know FRC doesn't have a notebook um, and that kind of thing gets put into a, a chairman's video. A lot, of, um, a lot of regionals have cracked down on that though, I just want to say. That has changed over the years. Now that doesn't mean every area and districts can be a little bit different. Uh, for that, but there have definitely been uh, teams that have been called out uh, on it uh, when they say they do things uh, and take or take too much credit uh, for what something is. I have seen teams get called out on it and disqualified from winning chairmans. All right. Well, you know, you're still hoping that's that'll be the case for uh, if if that is the case with the. I mean, I I don't mind the outreach notebook. I think the outreach notebook is necessary, right? You write a page about each event you do. And I think that's fair way to keep track and to prove that you actually did it. With the engineering documentation, I think it could replace the engineering section of a notebook. That's, that's uh, yeah. I don't know about the, and any other documentations that are documentation that's been um, uh, mentioned in, in game manual one though. So the, there was one more documentation that was the control award. The control award was shrunk down to three pages. Um, small, minor change, but I know teams were turning in like 20-page control awards. Um, right. In the past, our teams only turned in one page front and back or maybe one page front and back plus a half page. Um, so I don't think it's that bad to turn in a three-page control award. Like, have you looked at that? Uh, I have... I know my my team's historically only done the the one page that they've included on the um the back of the notebook that or the back of the award section that's got like the field diagram and everything there. Um, so I think maybe having a a strict page limit in the notebook might uh, encourage some teams to to do a little more than just the the single page as counter counterintuitive as that that could sound uh, because yeah. they know that there's there's like a guideline for them instead of just, you know, however many pages you want. Yeah, I, I think overall good changes. They're, it sounds like they're listening to the FTC community and that's what I like to see. Yeah. All right. Uh, another item we've got is in the past, uh, the order of advancements for awards has been inspire, think, connect, innovate, design, motivate, and then control, control being last. The new order is inspire, think, connect, contr can innovate, control, motivate, and then design. So that's putting control ahead of design and motivate, 
and then swapping design to motivate. Um, so, uh, Sean, why do you think they made a change like that? I mean, so the Control Award was recently sponsored by this company called Arm, and now it's the Control Award by Arm, so I'm thinking that Arm had something to do with moving up the advancement. That's not saying that it did. I personally love having the Control Award higher than Motivate and Design, but that's just me with my silver cap on. Yeah. Uh, uh, me being a design guy, um, it's it's a little... You know, it's a little weird to to think about design being the last one to advance. You know, at a at a league level, this might not be as important, but at a uh, state or um, regional level, I think that might change some things up a little bit. Uh, one of the things I've had experience with with the design and innovate contrasting against each other is, um, in my experience, the innovate award has gone to a a design that's that's interesting, um, but it, it may not be the best design. But it's something. It's a brush, breath of fresh air, and the design award is more of a general, um, like how well thought out your robot was. Yeah. So, well, the, yeah. I mean, we don't know what the Think Award is. That's our problem, right? Because now that it's going to be based off of the engineering documentation they may be changing some of the requirements to make it more design like which is why they felt like they could push the design award further back right um so i think that might be something to play since the think award in the past has been about math and engineering documentation and most teams that can win the think award can also win the design award because they're using math in their designs and yeah they're documenting everything so they have reasoning behind everything so uh just something that i think i don't know like have you as somebody who likes the design uh is the think award something that you think could be used as a substitute for design um i given the name change to engineering documentation it's certainly plausible that something like that could happen uh i think with them with them going back to the other thing with them shortening shortening the engineering documentation we might see some more uh some more award specific uh things that you have to do um to make to to lighten up the load around the notebook um so something like motivate might have its own uh set of criteria um but for design i i i'm optimistic that it'll it won't completely disappear into the shadows um so i i i think i think it, whatever it whatever it is it'll it'll work out good so. yep i i think a lot of people wanted to see control higher and especially since like i know personally for our team a lot of our innovate stuff came through software right because at a certain level most meta robots look the same and yeah. so the way you differentiate yourself is with the software. And so the fact that they're bringing up control, because a lot of judges, what they may say is, no, that's software innovation, not innovation. So that doesn't count for the Innovate Award. We're going to throw it under control. And so I think it's nice that control is finally getting some respect uh, because, like, especially in games like Rescue, where autonomous was worth nothing and, like, you could not win games, you could easily surpass a 60 point autonomous uh which was like ideally the perfect one uh i think it was the highest score in rescue um this finally gives some recognition to the teams that even if the game is not favorable for autonomous or even for teleop uh where software enhancements don't really help uh, this gives them some recognition all right, and the new game manual has completely phased out modern robotics. They have legalized the use of the control hub now instead. Uh, there are also two new uh, PS4 controllers that are legalized to teams, so the DualShock controller and there's another one. Uh, are these changes beneficial? Do you drive? Uh, would you use the DualShock? Uh, in, I've, I've only driven a couple times, but having, I think the most important uh, up part about them legalizing more controllers is getting higher quality controllers 
um, <laughs> because the that Logitech thing is just it's not great. <laughs> They'll crap out on you during a match. Yeah, like, that's just yeah. how it is. <laughs> yeah, so you know, getting a a like a first party controller from Sony or they included uh, one other is definitely. I think that's the most important part about them uh, legalizing this. Um, I know some people do prefer the PS4 controls more to, uh, uh, as opposed to the um, Xbox control. Now that I think about it, the Logitech one is the PS4 layout. Well, at least there's a higher quality version of it. But does it it's have the touch screen on the controller? <laughs> the Logitech, Logitech one, one definitely one. doesn't. <laughs> I think I think the PS4 one that's legal does so maybe teams can interface with that. That would be cool to see uh, if teams could like do cool stuff with the touchscreen. But yeah. um, one of the other things that uh, was smaller since they announced it before this game annual was they got rid of the ZTE Speed, the Samsung Galaxy S5, and the Nexus 5. And these were three of the older phones that they wanted to phase out. I don't know if they wanted to phase these out because of increased performance that they're trying to get out of the FTC SDK or whether it was just too hard to get access to these phones so te- it w- it could give teams an unfair advantage because they had access to these phones and other teams didn't um, that's something also interesting but I don't know if it makes that much of a difference with the control hub like I don't think you can recommend anybody to use phones since the control hub will be so much more reliable yeah I think most of the motivation around removing those phones is I know the ZTE speed itself was it was only 2.4 gigahertz. Yeah. And, um, you know, now that they've removed those phones, uh, I believe they also say you don't have to select a specific channel on your driver station or um, robot control. So, you know, clearing up any interference, uh, I think that that could have been the main motivation. And now all these um, all these newer phones that are on there uh, are getting cheaper because they're you know they're getting older. Um, I know we were able to pick up two of the uh, the newer five G phones last year for like sixty bucks a piece. So there's um, I think part of it is just incentivizing teams to to not use the, those phones if they can avoid it. Um, yeah. Yep, that's all I got for it. All right. Uh, so there weren't many hardware changes included in Game Manual 1 besides clarifications to make it easier to understand. Uh, the main one, the main change that they added or removed was the weight limit. Um, so no longer are you limited to 42 pounds. Uh, you can now build as heavy as you'd like. Um, please don't take that to the extremes. Uh, I'm sure. No, please the... do. Please do. <laughs> I I want to see it, but not at my competition. <laughs> um, so there's no more weight limit, and they have also explicitly outlawed vacuum mechanisms uh, and modifying servos to make them continuous rotation. Um, I think just the big thing there is the weight limit. You know, I remember seeing. Uh, I'm sure everyone's seen it. The uh, inconceivable robot the from Velocity Vortex, the Transformer with the two mini bots, that was something like eighty, upwards of eighty pounds. Um, that thing was insane, and it would be really interesting to see more robots like that. Uh, but, that was know. about the only robot that I thought was worth going over a forty-two pound weight limit. Like in I- FTC, like. Your motors are only so powerful, and if you use a four-motor drive at geared with a 20-to-1 motor, um, 42 pounds is pushing it. Like, I think the ideal sweet spot is around 35 to 37 pounds, and that gives you, like, a good balance between playing defense and being fast on the field, right? There's no real reason to go above 42 pounds. Just pocket your robot. Make it designed a little bit better. Yeah. Yeah, you know, maybe make it a little prettier instead of a, a little heavier. <laughs> Um, I know another one of the heavy robots I saw from uh, games past was, I forget what team it was, but they built a crane for um, Relic Recovery. That Winter sat Soldier? On balancing Stone. Yeah, I believe it was them. Yeah. That was another interesting robot. Um, 
So, you know, maybe maybe the meta in uh, in ultimate goal is just going to be not moving. So if that's the case, then go for it. Build as heavy a robot you want. But in most games, when you want to be maneuverable, especially in like Sky Zone, there was no reason for anybody to go above 40 pounds. Right. At that point, yeah. just pocket yourself and you're going to have to reduce weight. So then you're fast enough. Um, so I, I don't see a reason to go under like I thought the weight limit was kind of stupid in Rover Ruckus when it like, first came out. Teams should design better. Yeah. All right. Um, so there were some other miscellaneous changes that happened, um, weird changes that could give us a little bit of a hint about what the game could be. So one of them was the max elevation for game elements that are launched would change from five feet, uh, change from six feet to five feet. And there's no longer a team scoring element like there, there was in Rover Ruckus and Skystone. Um, and the last time that the max launch elevation rule was changed was Velocity Vortex, which, if you remember, was a shooting game. So this could be a hint that we are seeing a shooting game again this year uh, with just a lower target. Yeah, I think it's the natural progression of uh, first games that um, every two years we get a shooting game. I um, hope. Shooting games I, I sure hope so. <laughs> yeah. Um, I love watching them. Yeah. Yeah, it's certainly a lot more interesting than um, uh, than Rover Ruckus was. That was, who. <laughs> um, so seeing some projectiles will be will be interesting. Um, yeah, I think also the people who are competing this year that are seniors would have been in eighth grade in Velocity Vortex, which there's not that many middle schoolers in FTC. And yeah, if you're in middle school in FTC and you played Velocity Vortex you probably didn't have the best design and you could definitely build off of it for uh, another shooting game. So it will be an interesting challenge to see, um, especially since all this COVID stuff is going on. So seeing how teams approach this game will be kind of fun. Yeah, uh, especially since uh, with the move to uh, the option of remote games and allowing teams to compete with just half a field, um, it, it'll be interesting to see if if the shooting is done um, across like the floor or very very low uh, in the air, um, or if it's done like across the field to the other side. Um, they did mention that that the field the game had to be played on half of a field, um, so it it'll be interesting to see how how exactly that pans out with. Um, with the the field having to be shortened like that uh, and not having the ability to put two massive basketball hoops in the center like they did with uh, Velocity Vortex. Yeah, I I think with a game like this, we've in FTC only seen a horizontal goal where you shoot once, right? Like in FRC, uh, what was it? Not Steamworks, Stronghold. You saw you had to shoot it horizontally. In Infinite Recharge, you have to shoot it horizontally. While in Velocity Vortex, we had to loft it into the goal. And so by seeing the, um, we might see a horizontal game. That way you don't have to shoot as high, but you can still make goals like that. Um, And actually that ties right into... um, the probably biggest change that they made in the game manual was the announcement of remote events. Uh, In addition to the game manual for traditional events, first released a video explaining how remote events will work and a game manual covering how remote events will work. At these events, judging will take place over Zoom or some video conferencing, and teams will self-score their robot matches and have a window to submit scores. Uh, time window to submit scores. Uh, no video verification is required for these scores. There are no alliances at virtual events, and uh, these events can be played just using a half field. In the video, Ken Johnson, the director of FTC, mentions that the game will be played differently in person versus virtually, but the same robot can be used. So he did say, he mentioned the word, quote, defense. Um, and so there might be some more robot interaction when playing in person, but you could use the same robot for both uh, online events and in-person events. I think it'll certainly be uh, interesting to see the dynamic of different uh, regions either going fully in-person or fully virtual. Um, and if at some point a team that's doing, uh, that's doing good virtual ends up going to a traditional event and... Um, how how they'll stack up to the competition there. Um, so yeah, the I, yeah, 
I think one of the things that most people had a problem with these virtual events was self-scoring. Uh, there was huge uproar in the FTC Discord, uh, the sort of Discord, about teams being able to self-score their matches and no video verification being required, right? So any team could submit whatever score they wanted and there would be no proof that they actually did it. So I know there's been talks about like TOA, the Orange Alliance, um, uh, having a place for teams to upload their match videos to prove that they actually got what they got. Um, but I don't know, like us, I'm not competing in it anymore. So <laughs> it kind of like, I'm kind of glad in that way, but like as somebody competing, how do you think that it's uh, going to affect it? Uh, I think if, if a team really goes to, to say that, um, that they're, they're, getting like such a high score like if a rookie team is number one and they've got you know a world record then that would be kind of kind of sus but i think most of most of the motivation to to having no verification is so that teams that that can't film have an opportunity in um but i think most of the the uh honesty here is going to is it's going to end up relying on on the coaches who i assume will be the ones um actually inputting the scores so uh it's i think it, to some regard the the threat is is a little overblown um but there's certainly some some questions to be had there about the uh the verifiability of of some of the scores yeah i think there are going to be great rookie teams and so there's definitely some honesty involved uh in the video ken johnson compared ftc to golf because golf is all self-scored at the high school level um so um that is something that we can take into account i think that what the orange alliance is trying to do is um create a way for teams to upload videos because it's easy to record a video and just upload it. And especially if teams are going to have to be able to use video conferencing for judging, then they can definitely record a video and upload it for um, everybody in the world to see. So I yeah. hope that FTC maybe reconsiders and makes it mandatory to record a video, uh, regardless of what the quality is or whatever, um, even if it's not used for verification purposes. Yeah. Anything else you saw there, or should we switch over to trivia? Uh, no, I think I think it's trivia time. <laughs> awesome. So we're going to switch over to fun trivia. Uh, Tyler had already gotten uh, the player. You'll be playing against Egan for a chance to win $30. We have five trivia questions, and whoever gets the most right wins. Uh, if there's a tie, we will use time as a tiebreaker. Tyler, do you want to take it away? Yeah, so we do uh, have somebody on the phone here. We have Brian from Team 14470. Brian, how's it going? It's going pretty well. Yeah. Awesome. Man. Oh, I know Brian. You know Brian, Egan? <laughs> yeah, he's a, he's a Georgia team. All right, well, Egan says he knows you. Um, so we're going to – here's how it's going to work for trivia real quick. Uh, we're going to – have uh, once again uh, five questions for you to ask. Uh, you can pass the first time if you want, then we'll come back around. Uh, you only get to pass once though, and, and don't forget uh, the tiebreaker is answering as quickly as possible. Uh, so you need to answer as quickly as possible if you want to if you want to win. So we're gonna ask Egan to take off his headset uh, so you can't hear the questions that are going on. We'll give Egan a wave once we're ready to come back. Okay. Awesome. And Ashan's going to be uh, putting in the questions uh, as we go through. And uh, with that said, Brian, are you ready? Yep. All right. Here you are in. Uh, Ishan, are you able to hear him well enough? Yep, I can hear him. Perfect. All right. We're going to start in three, two, one. Name one of the two teams that have video evidence of doing a six-stone autonomous program in the Skystone game. Gluten free team one 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 five. What was the original name of the first tech challenge? I had no clue. Uh -huh. I'll pass that. All right. In what season was an FMS? In what season was an FMS abolished in favor of a sports start model for starting autonomous IntelliOp? 
Sorry, can you repeat the question? In what season was an FMS established, or I'm sorry, in what season was an FMS abolished in favor of a sports start model for starting autonomous and teleop? Okay. I think, was that 2017? All right, that's what we'll go with here. In what season was an eight second delay between autonomous and teleop in- implemented? Name one phone model that was legal to be used in the FTC control system for the first year that phones were used. Name one what? Name one phone model that was legal to be used in the FTC control system the first year that phones were used. Um, I'm going to say the Samsung Galaxy S5. In time. Okay. All right. How'd you feel you did? <laughs> All right, we'll give uh, Egan a wave here and uh, see if he comes back. Uh, we're going to put you on hold as we go through, and we'll come back and do the answers with you. So we'll put you on hold here. All right, sounds All good. right. All right, Egan, are you ready? I I guess so, yeah. <laughs> All right, your time begins I'll have to be in three, two, one. Name one of the two teams that have video evidence of being a six-stone autonomous in the Skystone program. Skystone game, sorry. Ooh, uh, negative resistance. What was the original name of the first tech challenge? Uh, first Vex challenge. In what season was an FMS abolished in favor of a sport start model for starting autonomous and teleop? Uh, pass. In what season was an eight second delay between autonomous and teleop implemented? Pass. Name one phone model that was legal to be used in the FTC control system the first year that phones were used. Uh, ZTE speeds. Great. And we're going to go back. In what season was an FMS abolished in favor of a sports start model for starting autonomous and teleop? Uh, I don't know. In what season was an eight second delay between autonomous and teleop implemented? Uh, block party. <laughs> In time. All right, so 60, there we go. All right, so we're going to go through these. We'll bring um, our caller back on here once again to go through these questions. These are some toughies, uh, Ishan, by the way. Um, <laughs> these were meant for my courage last week. <laughs> yeah. So, say, hi, say hi, how's dad doing there, Egan? <laughs> uh, he's, uh, he's coming in to say hi. <laughs> oh, hi, dad. You're live on the air. <laughs> All right. So with that said, we'll go through these. And uh, don't worry, we didn't show them too much again. So. <laughs> All right. So we'll go through these together uh, on these once again. Uh, so first uh, question here, name one of the two teams that have video evidence of doing a six-stone autonomous program in the Skystone game. Uh, so we had our caller here say gluten-free. Egan said it negative resistance. Gluten free is correct. One zero. Uh, what was the uh, name of the original? I'm sorry. What was the original name of the first tech challenge? Uh, Brian said, I don't know, uh, which we have to take that as the first answer. Uh, and then uh, Egan said, first Vex challenge. First Vex challenge is correct. One one. In what season was an FMS abolished in favor of a sports start model for starting autonomous and teleop? So Brian said 2017, uh, and then Egan said pass and pass. It is actually the 2015-2016 season rescue. So unfortunately, 1-1 one, one as we go through. In what season was an eight-second delay between autonomous and teleop implemented? Brian said 2013, and Egan said block party. It was actually relic recovery the 2017-2018 season, still 1-1. One to one. Question number five. One of you got this correct. Name one phone model that was legal to be used in the FTC control system for the first year that phones were used. Brian said the Samsung Galaxy S5. Egan said the ZTE Speed. One of the, one of the phones was the Moto G, and the other one was the ZTE Speed. Two to one. Egan wins it. Brian, I'm sorry. You do not get the $30, but we appreciate your playing. Thanks a lot, man. 
<laughs> when it, what, gracious words there as we go through. So, uh, so congratulations for that uh, once again. And that uh, will uh, bump our trivia up to $40 on Tuesday's FRC recap show. And of course, it keeps incrementing by $10 each time. So it might come back and be then $60 by the time we get back to FTC. All right. Uh, well, thank you for all the follows and subscriptions we received today. Don't forget that you can subscribe for free if you or your parents have Amazon Prime. We hope you enjoyed this episode of FTC Recap. If you want to stay connected with what First Updates Now FTC is doing, follow us on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram at FunFTC, and join our Discord through the link in the chat. We're always looking for feedback, so reach out to us on the Fun Discord and let us know what you thought about today's show. We tried a new format for FTC Recap, and we're hoping that we can use something like this shorter form, uh, more succinct uh, for in the future. So let us know what you guys thought. Uh, we want to bring the content to you that you want. On behalf of myself, Ashan, and our producer, Tyler, working behind the scenes, I would like to thank you for tuning in. Thanks for watching. If you want more fun content, be sure to subscribe and ring the bell to be notified about our latest videos. Thanks to all of our co-executive producers on Patreon and Tier 2 Plus subscribers on Twitch, keeping fun loud, live, and independent.